Today is October 21st, 2014, and we are interviewing George Hogro at Hinsdale Evangelical Covenant Church. Um, Mr. Hogro was born on um, November 18th, 1923. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. My name is Cheryl Walker, and I'll be interviewing. And uh, Leslie Lucas will be transcribing today. <clears throat> Mr. Hogro, <clears throat> would you like to tell your story? Well, we'll start way back when. I graduated, well, I was born in Innsdale, Illinois, over on Clay Street, and I graduated from Hinsdale High School in 1941 at the age of 17. And a few months later, had to, became 18, had to register for the selective service, even though they weren't drafting any 18-year-olds at the time. Two or three weeks later, well, three weeks later, old Tojo bombed Pearl Harbor and threw us into the war. So what's a young fellow from Hinsdale to do, or anywhere to do, but to contemplate signing up and get this thing over in a hurry? Well, I waited a little bit, decided that maybe I'll try to join the Marines even though my dad said, hey, George, wait a little bit. But George wouldn't listen naturally and went down, took the physical to join the Marines, and lo and behold, I found out I had high blood pressure. A, a jock from Hinsdale with high blood pressure? <laughs> Couldn't be, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to be 4F, unfit for service. So I happened to be sitting down in the drugstore, Vans Drugstore, which had a soda fountain at the time, and old Doc Mathias came in and we started talking. And I told him my plight, and he said, you really want to get in? And I said, heck yes, Doc. And so he went over to the pharmacist, and he came back with a little coin envelope with some pills in it and said, here, next time they go to take your blood pressure, pop under your tongue, you'll pass. And so I didn't know what to do. I had that thing in my pocket for carrying it around, and it, it was burning a hole in there. So I figured, well, I better not try to join the Marines again for fear I might get two strikes against me. I didn't want to go in the Army. so. A couple of my buddies had joined the Navy, so I thought, well, I'll try the Navy. So I went down and took the physical, and popped a little pill in my mouth, and sure enough, I passed. And next thing you know, I was up at uh, Great Lakes for boot training camp. And in those days, a boot training camp was very short because they were anxious to get people out into the fleet. And But they did give us all of our ooh shots. And we got uh, our uh, clothing allotment, and a little bit of uh, indoctrination. And believe it or not, I never fired a rifle all the time I was in service. As a Navy man, they weren't looking for infantry, they were looking for sailors. So, but they did interview us as to what uh, we might be able to uh, assist and, and be specialized in. And I had taken two years of German in high school, and I also took, as a goof-off course, a couple of us seniors, we took typing <laughs> to be with the girls. <laughs> and uh, they asked me if I wanted to be an interpreter, and I said no, all I had done was mostly conjugate verbs and whatnot, but uh, I would, how about uh, being a radioman, so they sent me to uh, Northwestern. They, they offered me a, a radioman or a, a, could be a, a storekeeper. They sent me to Northwestern uh, to learn Morse code, and I, right down at Evanston here. And I was there for three months uh, learning Morse code. And after three months, uh, I got shipped out to the 
Puget Sound Navy Yard, which is in Bremerton, Washington, just across the sound from Seattle, and <clears throat> was there just a short time. And I was assigned to the USS Detroit, which was a light cruiser. And I sailed on a, a troop ship up to uh, uh, Kodiak, Dutch, no, the Dutch Harbor, and uh, waited there for uh, the Detroit to come into uh, into port. The Detroit was part of the uh, task groups that were up in the Aleutian Island campaign in the northern Pacific and the uh, 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 Bering Sea. And uh, we, they came in and, and uh, I, uh, was this, uh, my, the ship came into Dutch Harbor, and then we went out to uh, out to the Detroit. Uh, the Detroit came in, and as we were sailing uh, the waters up there in the Aleutian Islands, the uh, seas were very, very rough at times. It was very seldom that the sea was uh, calm in, in, in any way. At any moment, the uh, wind would pick up and uh, uh, the seas would, uh, they called them willowas, the uh, people up there, the winds, and the, the waves would get up to uh, uh, 30, 35 feet, uh, uh, winds up uh, 60, 70 miles an hour, and as the ship would dive and heave and plunge and the uh, we tried to copy, we were copying Boris Code all this time. Uh, the uh, uh, radio men, we had radio silence. All we did was copy uh, code. There was no uh, satellites or uh, computers or calculators. Uh, everybody relied on uh, the corp Morse code for uh, information. The, uh, uh, Reuters International and UPI all sent uh, all their uh, news releases uh, via Morse code, but uh, in the Navy, all of our na uh, messages were encoded as well as uh, <laughs> in Morse code. And uh, a message consisted of a, a, after a heading, there'd be five characters in a space and five characters in a space. And the first two sets of five and the last two sets of five would be the same, which would let the decoder know uh, how to decode the message. And he would type that in, and the message would come out. Hopefully, we had copied it correctly. And uh, this was what we did as a radio man on board ship. Uh, uh, we did have, uh, they called them the, those the Fox schedules. We did copy uh, Reuters and, and uh, uh, UPI, to, we put out a little newspaper, or a little newsletter, it wasn't a real paper, we, we called it the, the, <laughs> the uh, uh, porthole, <laughs> and uh, we ran it off on an old uh, a mimeograph machine, we cut a stencil, and we would uh, uh, run copies of this off to the, uh, for the rest of the crew. But uh, once he, this was day in and day out, uh, but the, as I was saying, the weather up there was so bad that sometimes it was almost impossible to get uh, signals good enough, and, and we struggled to get it. And when the sea did, did get rough, the, the ship would roll to uh, starboard, and the typewriter wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't want to go up. And when the ship <laughs> rolled to <laughs> to port, it would go zooming down. So you ended up one hand on the carriage holding it and had to type the code with just three fingers, two fingers in space, two fingers. And the seas were, like I said, so rough that the bow would dive down into the wave. And when the bow dove down, naturally the stern comes out. And when the stern comes out, the screws, propellers, are spinning like crazy. And when the ship finally settles down, it everything just shook. And when the shook, ship shook, the whole crew cheered. <laughs> we call that the Navy Yard bounce, <laughs> because indeed it was a Navy Yard bounce. The welders had to go watching the 
thwart ship beams to make sure they hadn't had any cracks. And in the time that we were up in the Aleutian Isles there, we had to come back to the States to, for ship's repair. And we got into Bremerton uh, Navy Yard and into the dry dock there. And one time uh, in 1943, we were so, uh, we were in there long enough so that we all got a, a two week uh, leave to come home, which was very strange for any uh, any of the sailors uh, assigned to the, the sea duty to uh, have, gotten, have gotten home. So I did get home for uh, for that period of time, and going coming to Illinois, we were on the uh, little old train, uh, going in uh, no air conditioning naturally on any trains or anything. But going back, uh, I don't know which one of my relatives uh, pulled a deal where I was able to fly back on a DC-3. So uh, there were 21 passengers and a steward and a flight attendant, or, and uh, so that was quite an experience to get back and, and flying through the, when you went through the mountains, you had to kind of wiggle and zigzag through. They couldn't fly over, over the top of the, uh, Rocky Mountains to get there. But anyway, back up to the Aleutians, and we were there for the rest of the uh, Aleutian campaign uh, with uh, Attu uh, 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 ended, and we would, well, during this time, we would, bomb, we would uh, the ship would, uh, any bombarding that we could do uh, at, and to assist the uh, ground forces, we would, uh, um, so do that, but after a while, it was the fighting got so close up in Attu that uh, we could no longer uh, assist in any way. But we did start bombarding the island of Kiska, where the Japanese had also uh, uh, invaded, and we would bombard. And we were mainly watching to make sure that nobody tried to. Uh, attack us through the Aleutian chain, which is what the, uh, uh, they believed the, the Japanese initially uh, wanted to do. So the, uh, after, after the Kiska uh, bombarding and that, and they finally uh, went ashore, the army invaded, there weren't any Japanese left on the island. They had all somehow or other uh, evidently escaped by uh, submarines and whatnot, but there wasn't a there wasn't even a lukewarm pot of coffee there left. <laughs> so we did. We then made uh, a final. We made a run. Uh, there were like uh, four, three or four, four uh, light cruisers and like five destroyers. At the end. Uh, well, it was the middle of 1944 that we made a, a final bombardment run over onto the Karelli Islands, uh, which were that's immediately north of of Japan Islands there, and at the town or the seaport of uh, Matsuato, that uh, well, we uh, went during it was early morning during the night, but uh, like three o'clock in the morning. And uh, we, uh, the, all of our little task group, uh, bombarded uh, the uh, city of, of uh, Matsuato. I think we uh, expended like 400 rounds of, uh, uh, the Detroit had a six inch gun, so we uh, expended our six inch uh, uh, 400 rounds, and I imagine the other ships did the same. And then we uh, retreated in a hurry to get uh, out of the area in case there were any submarines that uh, might be able to uh, track us. And, and we had enough speed so that we could have outrun a, 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 any submarine. And then we came back to the States, uh, back up to Aleutians, and we were assigned to come back to San Francisco to uh, get some new radar gear on board ship and, and to refurbish a little bit. 
but instead of letting him sit in San Francisco and uh, do nothing because his radar wasn't quite ready yet, they uh, sent us down to the west uh, patrol the west coast of South America to uh, keep the, any Nazis from running the blockade of South America. So naturally, we uh, when you go down to South America, you're going to cross the equator, and uh, there has an old Navy tradition that any sailor who has to cross the equator is nothing but a slimy little pollywog. But once you cross the equator and are duly initiated and stand before Neptune and Davy Jones and his royal court, you become a seasoned salty shellback. And so it was with the Detroit. And since we were in relatively uh, non-hostile waters down there, and since our old captain was a shellback, he allowed the other shellbacks to hold court on us. And we, he held court for, well, to start out with, they, they put a, a, one of the whale boats off to the side and Davy Jones came climbing up uh, the ladder and he read a block crop proclamation to the captain that uh, whereas the good ship Detroit was going to be entering the, his uh, royal uh, uh, main that uh, he would be coming on board to uh, with the court to hold court on all the uh, polywogs and they gave us all a, a, a we, we all got a, a, a I noticed that we had to uh, a subpoena and summons extraordinary, the Royal High Court of the Raging Main, <laughs> etc., etc., and the whole thing of, of all this uh, slimy stuff. And, and we had a, a challenge on the back as to why we had to appear before the Neptune. And my challenge was that my big ears were blocking the view of the ocean. <laughs> but for days ahead of time, we we had all kinds of goofy things. They, uh, we polywogs had to wear our uh, underwear on the outside of our pants so that uh, any shellback could recognize us and, and uh, make us do all kinds of dumb things. I, I had to walk around with a swab, uh, uh, Navy swab, and, and if any uh, shellback saw some other polywog, I had to go wash his face with a swab. And uh, <laughs> the uh, assistant gunnery officer, who was also a polywog, they dressed him in his uh, in a diver in the diver suit without the helmet, of course, but the the, the diver suit, and they uh, had him standing on the forecastle with uh, up on the bow with a pair of uh, binoculars looking for the equator, and <laughs> and on the day that we uh, did cross the equator. The uh, signalman ran up a, a skull and crossbones on the, on the, on the uh, signal uh, arm, and we were all gathered off to the side. And the first thing when we got up on the uh, after deck, the, uh, the Neptune they they moved. We had two airplanes on board ship, and they moved. It, they were on catapults. And they moved the, air, the planes up on the catapult far enough so that King Neptune and his uh, royal court could sit there and, and uh, uh, observe the doings. Well, we uh, went up a, a slight ladder and up a, a deck, and they had a, a barber's chair. The royal barber was up there, and you sat in the royal barber's chair, and he his scissors were electrified and he, <laughs> he hit you with those things and you got a shock and just that quick the chair was rigged so that it was dump you over backwards and you dumped over backwards into a, a big tank of bilge water well, he was slimy oh gosh <laughs> and you climbed out of that tank of bilge water on a cargo net and they hosed you down with a fire hose to get it off, all off. And, then you, and at that time, you stood before the Neptune, and, and uh, some of the guys were signaled out for some funny things that uh, t 
to have done, but uh, fortunately I, I wasn't. Although the the shellbacks couldn't, we didn't have any wood on board, so they didn't have paddles like a, a fraternity a paddle of any sort. But they made shillelaghs out of uh, rope and uh, wrapped with uh, canvas and soaked in salt water, so that they became a pretty, uh, could have been a lethal weapon. And But we had to cr uh, slide under cargo nets, we had to climb over cargo nets. Uh, all the while you're getting uh, initiated with uh, with these paddles. And the, oh, the royal devil had a, a trident that was electrified, and uh, the royal padre had a cross, and he, he blessed you with his cross, and <laughs> which was electrified. And uh, they had uh, some, one of the, the air uh, canvas tunnels that we used to have that they would uh, put up to get fresh air down below decks. Uh, you had to crawl through that thing that uh, initially, I think they had tear grass gas in it, but by the time I got uh, going through it all, well, it was uh, just a, a very faint smell. But you got all the way up to the end and they grabbed you and said, uh, are you a shellback or a polywog? And if you didn't say that you were a shellback, they'd send you through again. But then we went down below and we were able to uh, shower and, and get ready. But in the rest of the trip down to uh, into South America, we sailed from uh, Ecuador, Guayaquil, uh, Ecuador, down to uh, uh, Lima, Peru, the uh, seaport was Caleo, and uh, down to Anafagasta, Chile, or to uh, 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 Valparaiso, Chile, uh, back and forth. And we could stay in port uh, for you had to be out of there. They were neutral country, so we had to stay. You could only stay uh, up to 72 hours. So for the most part, we just stayed in these uh, ports for two days, and then we'd go back out to sea and, and go down to the next one. So it was uh, quite an experience. We'd be out to sea just long enough to get enough money so that we could go ashore. And the most we could trade in was uh, $30 American month. But uh, of course, Lima the, and Peru, the exchange rate, as I recall, was six soles to a dollar. So that uh, it, it was quite reasonable. Down there. But when we got down to uh, uh, Chile, the tr exchange rate was 30 to one. So we got <laughs> 30 dollars. We, we ended up with 900 uh, <laughs> pesos. And everything was quite reasonable down there. Uh, in uh, Lima, one when we first got in there, there was a, a little young fellow came up and he uh, introduced himself. It so happens his name was George Henry, which is my name, <laughs> and uh, he wanted us to uh, be an interpreter for him. And he said, uh, "I don't want any money. I don't want any money. He said, I just want you to talk English to me, and uh, if you want to uh, buy anything." So you tell me what you want to buy, and I'll go buy it because otherwise they'll charge you too much for it. And when we went to a restaurant, he wouldn't come into the restaurant with us. He sat outside. And uh, when we the next time we came into port, there was little George Henry who was waiting for us. So I would imagine there were other ships uh, doing the same. And uh, it was funny because the one. Well, we, we went down to uh, once, I think it was a Sunday that we got in there, and we asked George, you know, what, what can we do today? He said, well, we got, uh, how about a bullfight? And he said, no, there's no bullfight uh, on that day. He said, but uh, we can go to uh, the horse, uh, horses. So we went to the horses. Uh, but he wanted to go to the jumpers and we wanted to go to the flat track. So we did both. We went first, we went to the, uh, watch the jumpers a little bit and then we went over to the flat track. And when we got to the track, we had gotten there too late uh, for the first race. So, but uh, we asked him, you know, uh, the program is, uh, you know, in, uh, I don't know what Peruvian, uh, 
language was, but uh, 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 asked him for a, what horse. So we had all put a couple of soles in the, and went down and bet on the horse, and the horse won. So we said, okay, George, this was like a second or third race. So who, who do we bet on now, George? And he came up with, uh, well, uh, this horse. So we bet on that one, and it came in. And we bet all that back again. And he says, oh, no, you're betting too much money, too much money. So we said, come on, George, one more, one more horse. Well, I, I don't know if this is a, his uncle must have had an in or whatever. But anyway, we bet on the horse. And the horse started out, and lo and behold, he was out way out in front, and just as the came into the home stretch, the jockey stood up in the saddle, and a hundred to one shot went into hundred for him, and the crowd went wild. Well, you've heard of soccer fans going wild down in South America. Well, you wouldn't believe how this was. They started tearing the place up, the jockey jumped off the horse and he went running across the, and they threw rocks. The Perry Mutual board, they threw rocks. They were baking the winners. We were up in the, the, the grandstand in the clubhouse. Between the grandstand and clubhouse was a arch of flowers. They ripped all that up and they threw rocks and they were breaking the windows and jabbering. and. Uh, all of a sudden, an uh, officer from the ship came on and said, uh, you Detroit sailors keep out of this ballet. In fact, he says, Re report back to the ship that uh, the liberty's over. So, well, yeah. And, and they came up and, oh, the uh, they didn't have any police. The, the Like the army was, the, they were riding on, on horses and they were meeting the people. And, and they finally came up and said that, uh, the jockey club was going to make good, and they would pay uh, win money on both horses, but it would be in the paper. So we had all these tickets, and we tried to give them to George, but he wouldn't. He says, oh, no, no. He says, come on, George, we aren't going to be here anymore. And so he finally did take them. So I, I hope he <laughs> enjoyed them. Anyway, we left, left Peru, went down to... Uh, uh, Chile one last time down there and I managed to get into Santiago, Chile, which was over the mountains to get in there and uh, over the Andes and back again, which so that was overnight. So we had a real good liberty in, in uh, Santiago. So <laughs> then back out and as our trip back up, we got called back to the States. So we stopped off at the Galapagos Islands on the way back and uh, the radio guys on the Galapagos Islands invited us radio guys to a, a baseball game. So I got to play baseball on the Galapagos Islands. <laughs> and I got to go swimming uh, in, in one of the bays down there, right by the place. And there was a, a couple of seals in the water and, and we were having a, a good time with the seals. <laughs> I, th I don't know if they were having more fun than we were. <laughs> but anyway, all that back up to the States. I uh, took off our torpedo tubes. They figured we wouldn't need those anymore. I got the new radar e equipment and they refurbished the ship uh, to uh, accommodate uh, Admiral uh, Barry came on board uh, and uh, the Detroit became the flagship for uh, <clears throat> Admiral Barry and he was uh, Com Sir Ron Six commander of service squadron six and uh, we sailed out uh, past uh, uh, we picked him up in Hawaii and uh, then we sailed out to uh, Ulithi uh, where we joined the uh, third fleet out there the third fleet was getting ready for uh, the attack into uh, uh, Iwo Jima and uh, so uh, the Detroit and the Com Sur on six. Basically, it, it, I guess you might call it the start of a Walmart or something at sea because 
Admiral Barry coordinated all of the ammunition ships, the oilers, the supply ships. We had a regular uh, freight train, so to speak, coming across the Pacific Ocean, and we rendezvoused with all the ships of the fleet uh, a few hundred miles east of Iwo, Iwo Jima so that the uh, aircraft carriers and the battleships and the, all the, the bigger ships were able to uh, support the troops on Iwo Jima, which was kind of, I think, threw a curve at the Japanese because they didn't see how any, how this could, supplies could keep coming and blasting and blasting and blasting away and not have to, to be farther away than what they were. So <clears throat> after the Iwo Jima campaign, we moved up to uh, uh, Okinawa and at the end of the Okinawa campaign, all of this uh, going back and forth, we were out to sea. We didn't see any land for 90 some days <laughs> that we were out to sea, but we were, we were in the waters up off of Okinawa uh, waiting uh, for the invasion uh, to go into uh, Tokyo, uh, into Japan. And the weather uh, report showed that there was a typhoon coming up out of uh, South China, South Seas, and that uh, our admiral and uh, Barry and uh, several of the other admirals advised Halsey that, uh, who was in charge of the third fleet, uh, he was uh, compact, that uh, com com commander of the third fleet, that if we moved a few mi hundred miles maybe to the east, that uh, we would avoid uh, the brunt of the storm. But old Bull Halsey, as they were called, no wonder they called him Bull, he bullheaded, he said, you maintain course and stay in your position which we naturally did. And uh, I had to watch mid-watch. And uh, oh, the, storm, the seas were really rough uh, uh, that particular day. And I had the mid-watch, and by, oh, one o'clock in the morning, maybe two o'clock, all hell broke loose. We pitched, and we heaved, and we rolled, and we dove and anything that wasn't fastened down went flying all over the place. And our, our fresh air intake for our radio shack was up above the pilot house, and the waves were coming green over the, over the bow, up out of the pilot house. They had to open the windows in the pilot house to keep from uh, breaking the windows. The uh, sailors uh, rigged up a line across to the, to more or less tie the helmsman in place. The uh, air, the water came down through our fresh air intake and water was coming out of our, uh, out of the air vent. So we had to uh, close that off because uh, you had the uh, hatches, uh, the had uh, six inches or so and our power packs for our radios were underneath the, the uh, desk. So that we had to shut that off and it, we couldn't possibly copy any code, and the radar was absolutely no good. In fact, they uh, told the uh, uh, man to switch uh, searchlights, and they put the the uh, searchlights uh, on to uh, because we had uh, ammunition ships, we had uh, oilers, we had merchant ships, all in our group there, and uh, took. You know, try to avoid, be able to avoid them. We had, you know, four screws on a Detroit, but the uh, these merchant ships only had one screw. They were more or less at the mercy of the storm. But after this uh, hour after hour, when the things finally calmed down, uh, both of our airplanes had been dumped on, ripped off of the catapults and uh, dumped onto the deck. And uh, the one uh, 
one of the uh, the Davids uh, holding the uh, motor whaleboat just got ripped off. Uh, but worst of all, our the number three screw, uh, the sp spinning of the of the propeller, it sheared the teeth on the reduction gear, so we had to shut that engine down. And, uh, it uh, ended up, I believe, there were like 35 ships that maintained uh, major damage. The uh, O-70-75 aircraft uh, uh, bad. The, uh, the winds were reported to have been uh, like 70 knots. No, the waves were 70 feet high, I'm sorry. The waves were 70 feet high. The wind was 120 knots, uh, not a mile and a quarter. That means the winds were 160 miles an hour or so. The, the, sea, the aircraft carriers, the, the four struts on a, a flight deck were folded up and ripped up and dropped down uh, so, so, uh, for, for their damage. But the, the worst damage was the USS Pittsburgh the USS Pittsburgh was a newer ship, and I guess it was built too stiff for something, but it actually wrenched in half, and over 100 feet broke off for a bow. And uh, luckily, they were airtight, contained, uh, was, had been made airtight, and uh, the two pieces floated. But uh, we, after the storm, uh, we went uh, down to uh, the Philippines. We went into a lady. Uh, the Seabees uh, <clears throat> had already established a reestablished Navy base, and they had a, uh, a floating dry dock down there, so the Detroit was able to get into the floating dry dock and uh, uh, get that screw repaired uh, enough so that we could get back out to sea. We could only uh, we could only do 31 uh, 31 knots, uh, but. Uh, instead of 35 knots, but we figured that was uh, would be good enough. So we went back up and joined the uh, rest of the, of the fleet up by, uh, off of Okinawa, between Okinawa and Japan. And it was then that uh, <clears throat> old Harry uh, Truman decided that uh, if we were to invade uh, the islands of Japan, that uh, there'd be a million casualties. So he, uh, decided that it was time to end the whole thing. And uh, <clears throat> they dropped the two bombs, and of course, the Japanese surrendered. And uh, we, uh, <clears throat> Detroit, uh, uh, we sailed into Tokyo Bay along with uh, other ships. <coughs> Excuse me. But the, uh, <clears throat> the Detroit, with the Admiral on board, we had a real good uh, uh, position were right close by, and we were able to observe all of the uh, uh, doings that were going on. Uh, very interesting. And uh, they had uh, a communication ship uh, nearby, and we had uh, uh, loudspeakers with uh, 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 on the, uh, so that we could hear what was going on as well. And. Uh, Immediately after the uh, surrender was signed, the whole sky just became full of Corsair fighters. Unbelievable. There had to have been at least two, three hundred uh, Corsair fighters came over. And uh, after the Corsairs left, uh, a big flight of uh, B-29 bombers, uh, the big old bombers, and they flew at a real low level and everything just shook out and uh, terrific uh, feeling of, of, of pride. And uh, he just wondered what those, uh, the Japanese dignitaries, you know, with their black, uh, tu uh, like tuxi or whatever, uh, tight tails and their, their funny black hats, but must have thought, but you, you know, this, they did not have any of their swords. They told him, oh no, fellas, no swords. So anyway, a couple days later, we, uh, the Detroit, uh, went in, tied up to uh, uh, Matsua, uh, or, uh, uh, what's the name? 
can't think of it right now, uh, in the Tokyo Bay. And uh, we put the Admiral ashore and his uh, staff. And uh, oh, we did get a, I got a liberty and uh, uh, even though we still had to copy code, uh, the rest of the ship could uh, shut down, but we had, to, we had to do our, still copy all our code. And uh, they get a liberty into Tokyo, and it was amazing that uh, riding in on the uh, train uh, into into Tokyo, that the, the bridges, the roads, tra train tracks, all intact. But as you approached Tokyo, you saw just the skeleton of all the buildings that were there, uh, and you can just see what the uh, B-29 uh, fire bombs had done to the whole, uh, just burned everything out. And uh, they had foxholes were all over the place where you could see that they were uh, going to be bound and determined that they weren't going to give up without a heck of a fight. So you, you realize that it was Harry Truman did the right thing when he dropped the uh, atomic bombs. Anyway, we put the Admiral and his staff on shore. Uh, they were kind of upset because the Detroit got orders to go to report to Philadelphia Navy Yard for decommissioning. So <laughs> those guys who had been copying code, they, they had some radio men with, with his, they stood duty with us, watch with us, and they got put ashore and we got to go back to the States made the captain most happy when he got the word to go back to Philadelphia because he saw if we went back fast enough that he'd be able to get back for the Army-Navy football game. <laughs> so we went across the Pacific uh, midway uh, way to uh, Honolulu, stopped at uh, San Pedro to drop off uh, a lot of the crew at, uh, on the West Coast up through the Panama Canal and up to uh, Philadelphia Navy Yard where we, uh, I'm sure the captain got to see his football game. And at any rate, I had uh, plenty of points to uh, request a discharge, uh, service points. You got service points for how old you were, how long you were in service, how long you were overseas. And uh, I had plenty of points and I requested a discharge, got uh, sent back up to uh, Great Lakes for uh, discharge and uh, I got discharged on the 20th of December just got home just in time for Christmas and ain't it amazing what that little pill under my tongue did. It started a career. That's it. Can I ask you um, when you see another um, fellow Navy man do you ask them if they're a polywog? Uh, no. <laughs> I, although I, well, in a case, out of case, yes, I have. Yeah. And uh, other guys have also, uh, in fact, even uh, one of the, uh, one of my army uh, friends, which, uh, he went across the equator when he got down to the South Pacific down there, uh, naturally going to Solomon Islands and that, they were, uh, had the initiation, uh, but uh, on board ship, but his wasn't near that much. But uh, they they don't let them do that anymore because we ended up. Uh, I think there were like 15 guys that ended up in sick bay that uh, they had been hitting the kidneys with us uh, paddles, and they were actually uh, urinating blood. So kind of tough. <laughs> You had quite a cruise um, and went to quite a few places. My, we did. Uh, Sailed all the way from well, the Bering Sea down almost to go, the tip of South America. And uh, of course from uh, Seattle and San Francisco into Tokyo Bay, so. Did you buy any souvenirs in any of these places? Any memorabilia? Uh, no, uh, well, on board ship, we couldn't, we couldn't have a camera or anything. Uh, and we weren't supposed to keep a diary, and but I I didn't uh, buy really I buy any souvenirs of any sort. No. Did you keep a diary? No, we could. We weren't supposed to. What about your bunks? How many? Oh, uh, 
when we were at a uh, boot camp, we were still in hammocks, and we were in a hammock in boot camp. But uh, then it, on board ship, we uh, the troop ship that I went up to uh, uh, Dutch Harbor, and uh, that was five five bunks high. But in our uh, uh, the, on the Detroit RC division, we were just two two bunks high, and uh, our uh, C Division uh, quarters were all the way in the back of the ship. We were we were over on the starboard side, and the chief's quarters was over on the on the port side uh, down the, in the back there. Kind of a uh, the, the radio guys were we were kind of fair-haired boys, I guess you might say, because they relied on us for all of the news and whatnot, and uh, <coughs> we managed to. Un we did copy the stencil. We'd run off a little extra one for the cooks and bakers uh, with the scores of the West Coast uh, <laughs> so that they could uh, reciprocate by giving us, uh, hey, fellas, here comes a sheet cake of chocolate cake up for you guys. And <laughs> same thing with the chief's quarters. They were right down there with them. So we. We made sure that the chiefs and the uh, cooks and bakers got that little extra news. <laughs> what about um, you know? It, was there anything that you ran out of supplies? Why? <laughs> anything? Yes, yes. Matter of fact, we did. The last time we were in. Uh, Bremerton in the Navy Yard there. We, uh, one thing that when you were going into port, you took all of your clothes out of your little locker that we had and you made sure you put them in, the sea, in your sea bags because you took your locker and loaded them up with cartons of cigarettes. Cigarettes happened to have been 50 cents a carton. <laughs> And when you went ashore on Liberty in Seattle, you had a carton of cigarettes with you, <laughs> which was real good barter. <laughs> so we left the Navy, Navy Yard, we got out into Puget Sound, and we had to go through what they call a degaussing range to demagnify, demagnetize the ship and to recalibrate our radio direction fighters. So as a ship would circle around with a beam, we had to calibrate our, our radio uh, direction fighter. And in so doing, we were out to, in the, out to sea, but we couldn't open up the ship's door yet to get our cigarettes. And everybody, naturally, had gotten rid of their cigarettes on board because not only the radio gang, everybody else did it too. And people were going around sniping butts and looking for cigarettes. And finally, did we run out of some? Yeah, we ran out of cigarettes. <laughs> and the skipper came on, and he finally came up and said, okay, you guys, the ship's drawer will be open. You can get a package of cigarettes. It's gonna cost you a buck a pack and it's got to go into the ship's welfare. <laughs> so anybody says you can get one pack of cigarettes and make sure you don't smoke them all at once <laughs> until we get out to sea. And that's the only time we ran out of anything. We we really had it good on, on the Detroit compared to some of the other guys you hear of all this stuff that go on. We had the showers, always good showers. We had bunks to sleep in. Most of the time you had to sit down to eat. The cooks and bakers did a heck of a good job. And we even had uh, ice cream on board ships. <laughs> so every once in a while, uh, the skipper would call one of the little destroyer escorts that were in the outer ring to come on alongside and he'd treat them to a, a can of ice cream. So. <laughs> So yes, we we had it real good on board ship compared to a lot of these other guys. Rough rough at times, but most of the time I I'm sure glad that I joined the Navy and 
had a heck of a good good life for three plus years. Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? No, just I'm just glad I was able to serve, and uh, I'm gladder that I got home. Mm -hmm. How close were you to Hiroshima? To how close were you to the atomic bomb? Oh, I don't know. We, oh, we were out in the uh, in the uh, waters between Okinawa and Japan, so I don't imagine we were uh, that close at all. No. Okay. Well, at this time, I would like to thank you for the honor that you've given us to interview you. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed it, and I'd like to thank you. Um, for honoring us with your service. Wow.